Does it ever feel like Chinese people don't trust each other as much as other Asian groups would? This might trigger some people, but we gotta keep it real. That's because you guys are born into the lost generation. You guys left China when it is bad. Now you don't get to see it when it is good. <laughs> we gotta talk about this Reddit post. Do you feel like Chinese people don't help each other? This is from a 35 year old Chinese Australian girl. She says her parents immigrated from mainland China, but basically they kind of like had this backstabby type of community. Nobody really fully trusted each other. The friendships were very transactional and she feels like growing up in Australia, and I'm sure this applies to other English countries as well, other countries such as Vietnam and South Korea, in terms of their diaspora communities, had way more social cohesion and they would help each other more. Mm, all right, guys, we got to analyze this thread because there's a lot of responses. A lot of people are talking about how they also feel the same way. I'm not saying all Chinese people don't trust each other, but David, this is something that we've even spoken about amongst ourselves. So we're going to dive into the seven reasons why Chinese people don't trust each other and also the comment section. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, check out Small Lost Sauce on Amazon.com. That'll make you be proud of being Chinese. That's a product. It's strong. It's balanced. <laughs> um, Unite under Small I'm just l l Listen to her last sentence. She goes, all I know is mainland Chinese are ultra competitive and like to compare themselves with each other. And it sure seems like their friendships are not genuine. Ah, uh, so she's kind of talking about transactional friendships amongst Chinese people. First of all, what community did she live in, man? Maybe your parents shouldn't be running gambling dens. I'm just kidding. I don't know. But I, I kind of feel what she's saying. And I think on different levels, people understand what she's saying, right? You would agree that most Chinese Americans or Chinese growing up in a English speaking country would at least somewhat agree with her. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, but also, do they even trust each other in China, where all the Chinese people come from? Right, so we gotta look at this, Andrew. There is a concept, and this is a actual like anthropological, like cultural study concept, high trust and low trust societies. Mm. Um, by the way, here's the, the advisory levels. This is the way the Western uh, countries view the homeland countries. These are happiness levels. So basically there's all these different uh, metrics. However, Andrew, actually in 2024, social trust around the world, China ranks super high in right. 2024. However, most parents that are the Parents of a child that is 30 to 50 years old that was raised in an English-speaking country, Andrew, probably left when that social trust rating was super duper low. And I feel like that ended up transferring over the way these diaspora communities developed. Whoa, that's a theory. You guys let us know in the comments down below what you think of David's theory. I, I think that makes sense. Now, I do, for the, for the sake of the video, we have to be clear. We're talking about social trust amongst like individuals, like within the community, like within your Chinese, like, Chinatown, your enclave, or any sort of like Chinese community, it doesn't seem like they help each other as much. Now, we're going to talk about why, and maybe why, maybe that's just not true. But I guess, David, uh, before we get into the comment section, we've got the quick list we got to go through. Point number one, I think that a lot of the reason why is that China, or just whatever is Chinese, is actually a super diverse, large group. Yes, smaller knit smaller groups it's way easier for them to be tight-knit like south koreans they all came from seoul in the 1980s 1990s right they're they're all from they're usually christian right there's basically if you it's as simple andrew as a checklist how many things do you guys have in common with each other a lot of chinese people we don't even eat the same foods we don't even speak the same languages we could be mixed we don't even have the same religions or a lot of people are not religious at all so where are the things on the checklist that would bind people together right i mean let's just just to be clear right here I mean, you got Chinese people from different immigration waves in America, from different regions of China that even have different dialects. Okay, now everybody kind of speaks Mandarin, sort of, but not, you know, a lot of actually the old school people, they're not they're very good at Mandarin. Well, that means they can't like, even communicate. Right, so they can't even communicate. Uh, there's obviously a lot of Chinese diasporic uh, communities like Chinese Malaysians, Chinese Singaporeans, Chinese Vietnamese. All right, do they count as Chinese? And obviously you're talking about someone who's like a third generation Toy San American or a newly arrived Chinese student from Jiangsu. Like what? they don't have almost anything in common. Really, right. right? It's very, very difficult to compare small groups to large groups. Andrew, have you ever met anybody who graduated from Duke University? They are so proud of going to Duke. Have you ever met somebody who just went to like, you know, some, one of the largest state schools in their whole place? Uh, in the whole country, right. sometimes they don't really care. I'm not gonna lie, Andrew, we went to the University of Washington. I don't rep that like I went to Duke. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would say overall, uh, you know, I do think things are getting better and I do think unfortunately sometimes sad things or tragedies do unite people. And I think the whole 
Asian hate China virus thing kind of did unite Chinese people and Asian people in a weird way, uh, which it makes sense. But anyways, people are united by struggle. But a lot of people said this, this comment just to end point number one said, yes, we are very uh, split apart from each other, especially compared to my Indian and Jewish colleagues. Mm. So here's the thing, guys. If you understand those groups, they're ethno-religious groups, and they got a lot of granularity within them. If you really get into like, oh, are you a Hindu Brahmin? I'm a Hindu Brahmin. Are you like a, a Ashkenazi? Sikha. I'm Ashkenazi. I'm what are the Mizrahi or whatever. Like that gets actually super complicated. But uh, basically, being an ethno-religious group, it gives you like way more green checks in terms of the unified uh, right. glue. Right. I think point number two is that you got to stop thinking that Chinese. Just that whole word, which is very broad, and it means a lot of things, the word Chinese. It's not a tribe. It's not a tribe on its own. And to have high trust and really care for each other and really help each other, you basically have to identify someone as part of your tribe, right? Whatever that is, whether it's David, what? Chinese American millennial guys who like to play basketball in New York City. Is that a tribe? I mean, you kind of know, people kind of know each other, right? Well, it's that's a world because they all play in the organized leagues together. Right, but you, or, or, or like, you know, Chinatown business yeah, owners. Yeah, yeah. You have to have some type but, of tribal connection. But I think that what this girl is indicating is she could never go get over the fact that it seems like for other groups, just being Viet was enough to feel bonded with each other or just saying, oh, I'm Korean, you're Korean. It's like automatic gang, gang-ish. Yeah, I mean, but with Chinese... People got to ask you like 10 follow-up questions, right? right? Oh, you're Chinese. What type of Chinese? Right. What do your parents do? Are you high class, low class? Are you village, city, rural, yeah. metropolitan? Oh, what immigration wave? When did your parents leave? Are your parents pro-government, anti-government? Yeah. Right? There, would you, you would agree with that? Yeah, though. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean... Real quick, if you go over how Vietnamese came over here, obviously they have a more united like experience and struggle together. And Koreans obviously known for their strong national pride. Interestingly so. enough, Andrew, in Australia, most of the Vietnamese are from North Vietnam. And in America, most of the Vietnamese are from South Vietnam. Uh, point number three, sometimes being an American-born Chinese and ABC is actually not even enough to be united. Right, so you're saying... Forget just the word Chinese, which is just like way too big of a group to have a cohesive glued together identity. You're saying even the kids of those people, it's not enough. Yeah, because the kids are a reflection of the parents. They come, they're, they're, they're portions of their parents and they still carry over some of the thinking in the community. So, 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 so is it a tribal thing of like, oh, your parents were Taiwanese, my parents were Chinese, Malaysian, Hokkien, Cantos, and you're, that is the split or is it just it's not necessarily tribal markers from the parents. Well, it also depends on how much the kid cares about all these tribal markers, right? If there's pressure from the parents to stay within the Fujinese community and date other Fujinese people, you know, that's different. But obviously there is tons of mixing, Taiwanese, Chinese, Chinese, Malaysian, Chinese, and, Vietnamese, whatever. And it's kind of regional, Andrew. In LA, Taiwanese care if you're blue or green. They, in LA low only, key, in low Seattle, key. they don't care. In Seattle, they do never low ask. Low key, but yes, if you have enough Taiwanese people and you're deep enough in that Taiwanese community, they may care a little bit what your parents are. Blue what, or what their politics party. are, right? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. She says, I find it extremely difficult to find and connect with other ABCs. A lot of us are socially stunted by our upbringing where we were forced to study and do nothing else. And many ABCs are workaholics and don't socialize much beyond our workplace. Mm, wow, that's actually a really good point because- on top of all the factors that we've already said about Chinese being a big, large, diverse community and blah, blah, blah. She's also saying a lot of Chinese Americans who are workaholics and very educated and monetarily successful, they're not even great at socializing with each other. God, all right, all right, man. All right. Andrew, is, this, that, is that a stereotype? Oh, or you man. I, I'll tell you this. Of all the Asian subgroups, and let's just say there's, what, eight to ten of them, Chinese got to have the most variability in social skill because you can meet some Chinese kids that are born in English speaking countries and raised in English speaking countries that have like two out of 10 social skills. Yeah, yeah. it's true. We would, Chinese probably as a group focus the least on sociality, mm. like interpersonal pings and being like charismatic or whatever like that. It, it could develop or it could completely get thrown by the wayside. Point number four, Andrew. Chinese churches, temples, organizations, they do exist and help each other, but not holistically. Something may be lacking even when they do build a system to support each other. What are you referring to? All right, so basically, I'll say this. As somebody who was raised in a Chinese church, if somebody's mom got cancer or got hit by a car, everybody would go to the hospital. Right, yeah, no, it's a community. They're visiting, but they're if, helping But out. if a kid had boogers or like a messed up haircut or like, wasn't cool in school or no girlfriend couldn't yeah, date nobody yeah, you couldn't date anybody even if they were like 
25 or whatever and wanted a girlfriend, nobody would offer the upside help. Mm. Does, does that make sense? Like the downside, if something bad happened, they would still come together. Of course, I guess that's like a, it's like a medium tier team versus like a high tier team. You know, like how in the NBA, like some teams that win a game, lose a game, they got bad offense or bad, basically they're not strong all around. Right, right. I mean, I definitely think that those like minute uh, details, definitely they're not like, yeah, the coaching, the minute, the detail coaching. Right, of, right, right. of like how to make a better life. They, I think within the Chinese church and those temples and organizations, obviously they do care for each other when it comes to like your health, right? And stuff like that. If, if, if a couple divorces, there's some support but there. Are, though, would you agree those things are a little bit more obvious that a church has to come in and, and sure. assist, right? Sure, I will say this. And let's, let, me, let me say something nice about the Chinese people and how they treat each other. Considering how many Chinese people I know and how many people we know that do business, I don't know of that many who have been scammed by other Chinese. At least in the church world. Yes, there is, there, there is, it is, it does happen. But I just feel like it's not like rampant. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. I mean, we're referring specifically to the Christian Chinese community. I do think there are like fake monks and stuff like that that were like, you know what I mean? Sure. Oh, scamming off like the superstitious yeah, Chinese yes, stuff. Yes, yes, yeah. The old school esoteric Chinese culture. You definitely yeah, maybe see that selling s- fake ginsengs and <sighs> things like that. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. abalones that aren't worth as much as they say the tier of abalone. But I, I feel like Chinese don't rob each other that much, maybe. I don't know. I guess we're just not violent people. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point number five, Andrew, your mileage may vary. So basically, this is just the key thing with any group that says something like, very overarching about 1.4 billion people, or let's just say the diaspora is like 300 million people uh, in Western countries of Chinese people, all with all the Anglo countries added up together, where it's like, you know, there's people say things like Range Rovers have problems. Frenchy dogs have breathing problems. Toyota engines are flawless. Kobe's are the best basketball shoes. These things are all kind of true, Andrew, but they're not 100% true. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is, there's just like probabilities mm. based on stereotypes of Range Rover engines versus Toyota engines, but you totally could have got a bad Toyota engine or a great Range Rover that lasts 200,000 miles. So that's the way, that's the weird thing about stereotypes or archetypes, guys. Point number six, Andrew. Um, it's like attending a D1 university versus a hyper small private school. In a private school, you're just gonna get a way different experience than going to a public school with like 60 kids in a class yeah the camaraderie the community the support is just gonna be a lot tighter knit i mean if you want to compare it's funny that uh like chinese and jewish people there's like a history of relationships right whether it's like marriage or jewish guys married chinese women or whatever but like it's funny because that's like the biggest group of people chinese and Jewish people, which is like the smallest group so it's literally like a d1 school teaming up with a private and and that's to me, you guys have to understand, like, just large groups and small groups is very hard to compare them. Yeah, the small group, it's already like you got siloed off into a small group off the rip. Whereas in a big group, if you don't go seek out your own small groups, so to the point of the OP, the original poster, she said her parents were not religious. Well, so the fact that her parents didn't find that, you know what I mean, more niched out subset yeah. community uh, make a concerted effort to do that. That may be what made her subjected to these like uh, unmitigated downside impacts of being Chinese. I mean, just think about it, guys. If America is like a family with four kids, right? And you're like, oh, these kids, these this millennial couple had four children. That's a pretty big family for a millennial couple. But China is a couple that has twelve children because right. it's three times the size, at least, of America. So I'm saying that family of twelve is going to operate differently. Yeah. Anyways. Point number seven. No, no, real quick. I got to get to this girl's anecdote about it. She said that in Chinatown, her mom is a part of a community of middle-aged senior ladies who help each other out and are super tight-knit. But one time, her mom fell on the street and nobody was around her to help her and nobody helped her up in the streets of Chinatown because the people around her at that time were not part of that small group with her. Uh, She was outside of her tribe. Right, so I guess that's what people are saying is like sometimes you could be Chinese walking through Chinatown and you're still not with your tribe. Right, Whereas right. it maybe if you're Korean walking around Koreatown and you fell, you are. Somebody's- well, I think that's a good segue to my last point here and then we're gonna get into the comment section, but, uh, and this is just something I feel. Um, I feel like many Chinese people and parents and families, they don't tell themselves 
heroic stories of unity and fighting together and getting something done. What stories that your community tells itself or the stories that you tell your family, whether it's about your past family or just like moral story, just made up stories, you know, for like kids. and so, The stories you tell are important because that affects your identity. And I feel like that, you know, maybe it's because the Chinese Cultural Revolution and the Civil War and all that infighting happened fairly recently, to be honest. You know, so that's that's still around and that's the only recent story that they have. But like, what about all these ancient Chinese stories? Like, like, what about teaming up and those things? Like, how come kids, like, it just feels like Chinese people and maybe it comes to like helping an old lady up. It's like, they're not told to be like, bold or heroic leaders as much as they are told to be like scared survivors it feels like right right i mean it especially matters which province even potentially that your parents are from because the different provinces yeah. have like different yeah. provincial attitudes but not only that it was like the situations that you emerge from i will say this obviously this is not all I've seen a variance. I've seen some Captain America types. You know what I mean? I've seen some Wolverine we types. We know which some are, Chinese yeah. uh, firemen and, and policemen that Those, do a good job. You, the, the Chinese firemen and policemen, I put them more in the Captain America lane. Sometimes there's more like street type guys, but they still sort of like protect the community. I put them in the Wolverine lane yeah. where they're like kind of like not institutionalized, but they still could do some good things. But then I have some seen some people, Andrew, literally raise their kids with the mentality of Golem in the Lord of the Rings. You know, yeah, yeah, like, but, but money or like whatever is the ring, you know, well, how, you know, how Golem wasn't evil, but Golem was capable of doing something bad to get what his satisfy his greed. I opened the only bubble shop in the street yeah, and it needs to be it for me and yes. another, and another family opened up a bubble shop, but I hate them now. Yeah. Instead of thinking about how to make my boba shop more elevated and bringing more concepts and competing on quality, I just hate them. Mm, precious. Anyway, um, some people said it varies a lot. My parents are part of this Toysan Association in Chinatown, so I saw a ton of teamwork growing up. Toys, I, that's a tribe, though. Toysan Associations, that's a tribal association. Right. Somebody said in New Zealand, it seems pretty cordial. In Canada, maybe it's just an American thing. Somebody said it's not just an American thing. Anybody who immigrated to a Western European country that already had a highly individualistic capitalist society uh, develops this. Whereas the Chinese that moved to Eastern Europe to do business, for example, Romania, are going to have a lot of teamwork because that's how Romanian society is. So basically, they were saying it's actually a mathematical equation of where you come from, what era you left in, and the culture and what the capacities of the culture you landed in provide for. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I mean, I think that's a lot more algorithmic, more mathematical, to be honest, more layered way of thinking about it than most people want to. Um, somebody said it depends on what uh, province you came from. Uh, somebody said it's due to the forced snitching during the Cultural Revolution. A lot of people pointing at the Cultural Revolution of 1949. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a big part of it. I don't even think that's the only thing. Yeah, because somebody else said, uh, guys, my family's from Taiwan, and when Chiang Kai-shek landed, there was a lot of beef between who, the Taiwanese that were already there and the new KMT who came in, so there was martial law, so that was beef, and that didn't even happen on Chinese land, or that happened in Taiwan. Uh, yeah, I guess you could count that as connection to the Cultural Revolution. Right, 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 because I guess it was still, it was an auxiliary thing that happened as a result of it. Um, basically, somebody said, during the Cultural Revolution, all the politeness broke down. That's why we don't have as much bowing or people don't want to take care of the cleanliness of the streets as much as Japan or Korea. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the reasons, like I said, man, the Cultural Revolution, that's definitely a large part of it because it happened somewhat recently, but... Dude, Japan and Korea operate pretty differently. I mean, Japan once tried to take over the rest of Asia, you know. Korea's uh, made up of one group of people. China's made up of like 500 tribes. Yeah, of so giant. it's, uh, it, I'll tell you. Yes this. and no. You, you know what? As Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, you do have a choice. You get to pick and choose and say, hey, I want the politeness of Japanese. I want the pride of the Koreans, but I'm Chinese. What if you did that? What if you did that? Is that possible? Theoretically, if you could put, like, do the Matrix upload in everybody's mind, everybody could do it. Can you do it? But they won't, but they can't because that's not how life works. But theoretically- Is that too it, much work? It is just a firmware update, right? Is that too much work? Uh, some people might say it's a complete program rewrite, though. Um, I'll say this. If you really want to study Chinese society, I I'll get into a little bit, uh, guys. So some, some of the 
uh, social cohesion and all these charts that govern it, it broke down even when the Mongolians and the Manchurians took over China because the Han people were being uh, ruled by, you know, nomads from the north. And then, the, you know, the Qs, they had to wear the Qs. So there was already, that was already, they already stopped bowing in 1912. It wasn't, uh, the Cultural Revolution wasn't until 1949. So there was a lot of stuff that went into it, but of course that went into it. Somebody said, if you look at a 2024 map of social trust and cohesion in mainland China now, it's actually super high. But this is, Andrew, the parents aren't around to see it. Mm. But then somebody said, does it count if it's driven by CCTV and strict punishments, whereas in Japan, people have really high social cohesion and they don't necessarily have strict punishments? Right. Well, I guess to me, my whole thing is like, th th those are different methodologies, but I guess you could say the outcome's the same. I don't know if it's intrinsic or extrinsic motivation, like, does it matter? Um, this is a second long answer. This guy said, let's be honest, guys. There is no true Chinese identity. It is very convoluted over history and many dynasties. Hold on. What you trying to say, man? All right. What you trying to say, man? So first of all, I actually used to think this too, and he's not fully wrong. It's just, there's no easy, simple identity like other groups may have a more simple identity. Right. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, people are going to have to do the work, and I just think that being Chinese and understanding the diaspora and all these things, it was crazy, all these, like, dynasties and stuff. Other places only had a couple. We had, like, 11 of them or whatever. It's like... You know what I mean? It's just fundamentally different and more complex than other Asians. Well, who's going to do the work, David? Just the Fung bros? Are the Fung bros the only people that are going to do it? But, but by the way, I would say that it's very ABC thinking to say you need this moral proof of this simplistic identity because everybody else has a simpl more simplistic one. It's like, dude, whatever the functional identity is in 2024 is what you operate off of right, 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 algorithmically. Right, right. It's not about what's like, oh, I can morally justify this as an identity. Anyway, and then last but not least, Andrew, this was the most interesting. Some really long responses saying this guy's just said, you know, besides all the political stuff, I would just say that Chinese people are opportunistic more than anything. Mm. If being a, having good teamwork is the best outcome, they'll have a teamwork. If being selfish is the best outcome, they'll be selfish. Wow. Andrew, what do you think about this? Because uh, this transactional relationship thing was even uh, documented by this French guy who went to China called Voltaire. And he said, oh man, this place is just incredibly meritocracy, meritocratous and transactional. Mm. But he, he liked that though, because he was, a, I think he was a capitalist. So I guess what I'm saying is, do you think it is true that forgetting all these provincial splits and all these dynastic splits and all these modern, sordid modern history of China, Andrew, are Chinese people kind of opportunistic? And kind of transactional. More than other groups, just a little bit, just because I think the function of it being so big and China was very poor for a long time, so people left to go get opportunities. So Anywhere on the earth, really. China has been, people have been leaving, Chinese people have been leaving China for centuries, not just during the Cultural Revolution, centuries for better opportunities. So I do think Chinese like, uh, like a good opportunity. I don't think that defines everybody, but if there's other tribal markers that you have or, or some other spiritual, uh, maybe it's Buddhism or Christianity or whatever it is, you know, that ties you together, then, then yeah. Um, ultimately, Andrew, this Korean guy came in and said, yeah, I know everybody thinks that Koreans are really tight with each other, but sometimes people take advantage of those tight bonds, even in church, and will scam everybody and run away with the money back to Korea or to another Argentina or something like that. Yeah, I haven't heard that from a Chinese church. But I will say this, it's because like all Koreans are like required, I say jo jokingly, quote, required to go to church. So I think that even the scammy Koreans will end up in church versus I think like the scammy evil Chinese will not go to Chinese church. Yeah, I agree with you that because such a lower proportion of Chinese are Christian, the ones that typically go to church, they're kind of like... they pretty believing they're, they're, they're trying to go to church yeah because yeah, it's not part of our culture yeah want to be I, I would say this basically man there's pros and cons of being born into a tight-knit gang you know why andrew because andrew if you're born into a tight-knit gang and the gang flips on you or treats you badly that's even worse than if you were treated badly in the open freestyle market but if it goes upside for you within uh like a tight-knit community you could learn a lot of things and get a lot more hands-on coaching than you could in the freestyle open, like figure out your own life DIY style. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is there's just a lot of pros and cons. Yeah. Sure. But but I think what this OP is saying is that she desired a proper 
positive, productive, enlightening, small unit uh, identity growing up. And she felt like she couldn't have that due to being Chinese. Got it. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we can't really control these groups that we're born into. I think like the OP, she's like saying, oh man, I wish I had it. Like my rich Korean friend who like went to the good Korean church that didn't break apart and like got taught things and they went on missions trips and then she became a K-pop star. And now she's blah, blah, blah. Like that, I, I felt denied that from my identity. Mm. So I guess what I'm saying is, what, what, what would you tell her? I mean, I would just say, listen, people are born into different situations, but you can be the one to change it and you don't need the rest of your group to ch by the way, first of all, I think for the under 30 year old crowd of Chinese growing up in English speaking countries, it is changing. All right. Yeah. So I, I guess, guess so. that's what I'm saying. Like, I think it's getting better. I mean, and you have to be the change you want to see. I mean, I think just sitting there being like, oh, Chinese people don't trust each other and stuff. And just sitting there and whining. I'm not saying right. this. I was born into the bad zone. Yeah. It's like, dude, you, you can break the cycle. Like everybody is a change. And once you, if you do a, or a little organization or throw a little Chinese Chinese community dinner or something, you know, you get started that way. People will start to feel it, man. And people need other things to bond over. That is why people do go to church or temple or something like that. You know, just some other, or family associations, like just something, lion dance or whatever it is. You need some type of community, some other deeper connection. With right. You. But I agree. I think that this girl was born into what I call the dark times She's a second generation. The dark ages yeah. of being no, Chinese American. She's a American. second generation uh, Chinese uh, um, Australian born into an Anglo English speaking country, whether that's Canada, America, you know, New Zealand, Australia, UK, that was born in the dark times. She's thirty to fifty years old. That was a time where it was like everything was whack, nothing was cool, like almost like no, no the view of those internally within the media of those countries was bad too. So I guess what I'm saying is you just got to realize, yeah, you got born into a little bit of a dip, but you might as well catch the, the stock rebounding. All right, everybody, let us know what you think in the comments down below. Why don't Chinese people trust or help each other more? I'm sure we could make 10, 15 more videos about this guys, but I'm sure everybody has their own experiences. Some, some, uh, it seems like maybe in Toronto, the Chinese community seems pretty nice up there. Shout out to CCYA. I don't know. They seem like they got some nice things going on. <laughs> no, it, so, it, I would say this from an American perspective. I know a lot of people who feel how she does, but obviously having seen the world and this is part of our careers where we get to ping with like a inordinate amount of people and from different walks of life. I've seen a lot of examples that run counter to it too, but I feel bad for people who were born into it. And now they feel like their life from their childhood is like constantly repeating and like recycling. You know what I mean? It's like a bad movie that can't stop playing. Right. You got to take it on yourself, whether it's therapy or move or do whatever you can to break out of that bad movie to replay in your life. All right, everybody, let us know in the comments down below what you think. Uh, and until next time, everybody, maybe help each other out. All right, we out. Peace.